I would just like to preface by saying I'm probably going to be reading off a script for basically this entire thing. That way I don't forget anything. So if I'm sounding robotic, um, you know why. This is all stuff that's I've been thinking out over a while now. There's just so much to talk about in D2, things that I feel like could be changed. Uh, we'll, we'll basically get through everything. You guys will get a gist of what I'm getting at as we get into things. But this is not meant to attack any devs, player groups, or individual players or anything. These thoughts are my own. Uh, the PvP thoughts, which will be towards the end of the video, and you'll see like the timestamps in the description and stuff. Uh, those will be from Giggs, since he has a lot more PvP background than I do. Uh, the whole purpose of this project is to act as constructive feedback and start so to, uh, to start some sort of conversation with the community, especially the hardcore players, as to what kind of things we'd like to see uh, moving forward, along with some recommendations on how to approach these outstanding issues. I know we're coming up on some sandbox changes here very shortly in the new season on March 10th, uh, but uh, we're just going off of what we got right now. Another little quick fair warning is that a lot of these topics might bounce back and forth. I tried to put these in as good of an order as possible, but uh, this is about as good as I got. All right, the first section is about power level slash endgame difficulty retention. Power leveling in Destiny 2 is the indicator of your player's strength and also the factor that allows you to partake or complete certain activities in game, mostly PvE. Since the April update of 2016 in Destiny 1, the light level system has regressed in difficulty. This is largely due to the addition of the smart loot system in which, for quote, legendary and exotic item drops are generated with attack or defense stats greater than your current character's light level. Since the implementation of this system, it has conditioned players to always expect a bump in light level every time they receive a powerful drop. The same idea exists in Destiny 2. There is already an excess of the amount of powerful rewards that you can get in a week. From the soft cap up to the pinnacle range, these can range from tier 1s to tier 3s which give the highest bump in a single drop based on your current power level. Another drop that gives you a significant light level increases are the prime engrams which are guaranteed plus three drops, and you get two of them per day per character with a cap of nine total. Primes have significantly decreased the value of activity reward incentives because they stack and are guaranteed juicy drops when you get them. Once you reach the end point of the powerful cap, which is currently 960, there's an optional grind to get to 970 via powerful pinnacle drops. Striving for the pinnacle power level is not necessary for any endgame activities. There are very few activities in the game in which you can actually benefit from having these drops boost you up because of the semi-recently added artifact power level. The artifact power level allows you to gain bonus power via XP gains. These start out with relatively low thresholds and increase in XP required every single level. These artifact power gains reset every season around 3 months or so. But this doesn't stop many players from grinding out 10 to 40 bonus power levels every single season. Because of the ease of being able to grind out artifact levels, this lessens the meaning behind grinding out most difficult activities in the game to reach the highest power levels. Many of the endgame activities right now in Destiny 2 have a low floor of entry. Garden of Salvation is one example, uh, especially in relation to the maximum power of this season, yet this activity still rewards pinnacle drops. This raid starts at 920 power and ramps up to 940 at the final encounter. Another endgame example, Pit of Heresy, regarded by most as a three-player stepping stone that provides an accessible raid-like experience, is also at 940 power level. There's no issue with having a lower floor of entry for content like Pit of Heresy. That way players can have something to try before going neck deep into the raiding experience. However, this falls in the same power level as the raid, making it so that there is no real stepping stone in difficulty other than dealing with mechanics. Another major issue that lies within the end game is overleveling. Once you are over the power level of the enemies, even just by one power level, the experience becomes way too easy in terms of difficulty to complete, and this applies to every raid activity in the game. Once the enemies no longer pose as much of a threat, it's one less thing for you to focus on while you're doing that raid. There are plenty of potential solutions that fix many of these key issues related to power leveling and retention of endgame difficulty, the first of which would be to reduce the amount of powerful loot sources that a player can tap into each week. That way players aren't able to hit max light level, non-pinnacle cap, within the first week. More specifically, this means limiting the easiest milestones, completing matches, daily story missions, etc., so that players aren't oversaturated with powerful jobs. Daily login rewards can still exist, but there needs to be a choice between keeping the daily heroic 
uh, strike story mission gambit crucible uh, these all rotate or having daily rewards like prime engrams daily players have access to too many powerful sources between just those two subcategories so that doesn't include any of the weekly milestones of any of the sources in total there are 17 daily slash weekly weekly drops per character and that doesn't include any rank up drops from gambit or crucible vendor packages bounty powerfuls or prime engrams in Destiny 1, faction packages were an example of a more meaningful, slower method of leveling up. Uh, this gave players purpose to do things like strikes, which were already helping players leveling range between 385 and 400, so that they could earn faction packages, which would help them level up to 400, all while being able to chase god roll weapons they wanted, looking at you, LDR. All in all, this system encouraged players to do more of whatever they wanted, whether it be strikes or crucible at their own pace. The more you play equals the more reputation equals more faction packages. That way players aren't forced to do all different parts of the game in order to receive all the powerful drops for that given week. Along with the ease of access of a plethora of drops each week, we still have the artifact which gives us bonus power just by playing or turning in bounties. Since this leveling alternative is helping newer players gain access to things like dungeons, which is good, there has to be some sort of limitation set. I'm not definitive on an exact number at this moment, but maybe like plus 15 power max on the artifact. This way, the player who wants to go further to compete in things like raids, they actually are required to do some power grinding rather than just being able to avoid it altogether if they really want to. For difficulty retention within endgame activities, I think the best approach would be to experiment with how difficult power-wise uh, these activities can be made without pushing the players too far. Since hard mode is no longer a thing uh, within raids, raids are in desperate need of some sort of difficulty check for players, especially when they're overleveled. Theoretically, if the old system for raids remained in D2, it would be a lot more user-friendly in terms of being able to get new people to raid, as well as keeping the hardcore players interested. Just to make up a hypothetical situation here, say for example you're a new player who is at 1000 power. The newest dungeon is set at 1000 power and has a relatively low floor of entry. The dungeon can teach you how to work uh, with teammates to complete mechanics as well as getting used to learning all aspects of a boss fight. Playing for your life while still being able to complete objectives and progress. Once you're comfortable with these concepts, you've gained some power up to 1015. You now become interested in the normal mode of a new raid that just came out. You've heard about some of the cool armor and loot that comes from the new raid, uh, which is at 1020 power is what it drops at. And you're much more comfortable with at least giving it a shot. Since you're slightly under leveled, this will still be able to provide you with a new challenge while still being able to execute a lot of those key skills that you just learned from the dungeon. Once you've become more comfortable with the normal mode, you'd get to move on to the hard mode when you think you're ready for it. Maybe go in and get absolutely destroyed. That's totally fine. You keep at it, you work on your communication and understanding of how the mechanics work and everything within, inside the raid, and eventually you will get there. Hard mode will come with the most satisfying and most powerful loot too. Uh, for example, like Nano Phoenix or something from Wrath of the Machine. Uh, this will actually encourage newer players to have somewhere to start and incentivize them to learn the end game and have fun doing it. Uh, no team has ever first tried an encounter that is new to them. Uh, learn the encounters, learn the skills, make it part of your journey, and reap the rewards that the end game has to offer. This is just one example of how the end game experiences could be directed for new players. As for the returning uh, slash veteran players, erosion of difficulty after overleveling still remains an issue. This is mostly due to the fact that enemies just don't pose as much of a threat in D2 as they did in D1, especially during raid DPS phases. I.e., regardless of if you were overleveled for Vault of Glass, all enemies, especially the Templar, posed as a threat. For some reason, D2, it just doesn't feel like they really hit very hard. There's definitely an underlying issue uh, with the subclasses being too strong, which we'll touch on later, <clears throat> Well of Radiance. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the enemies shouldn't pose as a threat regardless of if you're in super or not. Let the enemies fight back. In the current state of Destiny 2, players have gotten into a habit of always expecting loot. At the end of each activity, whether it be strikes, raids, or whatever, most activities will reward a legendary drop. 99% of the time, uh, those drops will be immediately dismantled without even checking the roll on the drop. This has occurred throughout the entirety of D2 with the exception of keeping drops temporarily if they help you uh, power level when a new season or DLC drops. 
Lou fatigue is also relevant to exotics as well. The typical Friday visits from Zur don't help with this. Now that Zur's faded engram offers a guaranteed exotics that players don't have, there's no chase or grind for the ones that you desire anymore, aka there's no Gallahorn effect. I get that this is a way for players to experience the newest content, but also is removing the purpose from the game. It's a looter shooter. Aside from the drop rates of exotics, it also feels like there's a serious fear of making new exotics powerful in PvE. Many of the exotics that we've gotten over the past year or so cannot compete with the legendary exotic weapons that have been at the top of the pyramid for an extended period of time. Uh, Mountaintop, Recluse, Izanagi, Anarchy, Wendigo, Swarm of the Raven, you name it. Uh, this could be generalized to certain weapon types or archetypes being way uh, stronger than others. But the point is, is that exotics just don't feel exotic anymore, in my opinion. Uh, there are pieces that are decent, but will never cross the mark of being good and used consistently due to the fact that they can't even come close to competing with the S tier exotics, weapons, whatever it may be. I know Luke Smith addressed uh, shelving things in his recent director's cut, but we have no idea when that's going to happen. Okay, raid replayability. Aside from loot fatigue, there seems to be another loot-related issue recurring within raids, which is lack of replayability. Most of the raids in D2 are consistently untouched after receiving the couple worthwhile weapons, mods, and with each specific raid. The only raid drops that I still uh, see that have value to the player in this current meta are Zenith of Your Kind, The Supremacy, 1K Voices, Nation of Beasts, Taken Armaments, Taken Repurposing, Taken Barrier, Anarchy, Threat Level, Always on Time Sparrow, Fallen Armaments, Fallen Repurposing, Fallen Barrier, Key Rated Emperor's Courtesy, Hive Armaments, Hive Repurposing, Hive Barrier, Reckless Oracle, Relay Defender, Enhanced Relay Defender. Percentage-wise, the ratio of drops that are useful in relation to total drops possible isn't that great. This could be subject to change anytime we have a sandbox modification that might buff something like specific SMGs. Let's take like the Levy SMG, for example, if they buff that one specifically. Uh, the other half of these drops are armor. Any of the raid armor can have some uh, use one way or another, which is nice. But players are usually looking for the higher stat rolls on them, which is usually around the 60 plus range. Aside from that, the raid armor holds little to no extra value from non-raid armor when it is used outside the raid. For example, the Garden of Salvation armor set has a mod slot specifically for bonus perks within the Garden of Salvation raid itself. It has a couple extras, but the mod slot has no use for anything really outside the raid. This mod slot also exists on any other armor from Season of the Undying, which depreciates the value of that raid armor. Aside from the extra mod slot dedicated to that raid, this armor has no special effect over regular open world armor. The one situation where this changes is for the armor sets that contain any of the armaments, invigoration, repurposing, or barrier mods. Each of these mods in the Hive variant can be used with any of the levy armor, base levy, eater world, spire stars, crown of sorrow, which is nice. The fallen variants are available with scourge of the past or any black armory armor. For taken mods, these are available on both the Last Wish gear and the Dreaming City gear. Uh, these mods are a great example of perks being available useful outside the raid. While it would just be nice to see some different variants instead of just slapping another enemy race on the front of these mods and putting it in a raid, they are very useful, looking at you armaments, in the end game and are a good start to some bonus loot that can come from bonus chests within the seasonal raids. In obtaining all this gear that we talked about, raids, mods, armor, there's a problem with encouraging players to play them more than once. Right now, you only receive raid drops once per week per character. Uh, returning players have gotten into a habit of getting on every Tuesday to run their garden raids on all three of their characters and then logging off raids until the following Tuesday, unless they're missing something from another raid. There's no encouragement or reason for players to do the raid more than once a week on a specific character. There are multiple methods that could be used to fix this, one of which we've already seen in Destiny 1. In Wrath of the Machine, when a player received drops from a boss or a bonus chest, they also got Siva Nanite Fragments. These fragments could be used for re-rolling the raid gear, or to craft keys to open bonus chests at the end of each encounter. The other option would be to let players continue to do raids for a chance at loot after their first raid of the week on that character. The loot on the second run and beyond of the week would not be powerful, making it so that the only reason to run it again is for farming good stat rolls or different rolls on weapons, 
uh, wouldn't work for Raid Exotic. Uh, the only potential issue with this, which is subjective, I personally don't see a problem with it, is that players would just farm one particular encounter for whatever drop it is that they are seeking instead of having to do the whole raid. If this is seen as an issue, it could be changed so that players must finish the raid before being able to have a chance at the drops again. Either of these systems would encourage players to at least raid a little bit more for the loot that they're looking for in the current endgame. In the future, it would definitely be nice to maybe see some sort of love uh, for a lot of the loot that doesn't really have a place outside of just being dismantled for legendary shards. Strikes. In their current state in Destiny 2, playing farming strikes serve little to no purpose. The main attraction to strikes within D1 slash D2 is farming for strike exclusive armor, weapons, and other legendary items. If we're comparing to Destiny 1, which had a good amount of desirable strike specific items, D2 doesn't really come close. Yes, many of the weapons within D2 have strike exclusives within them, but most of them are not desirable and locked behind the strike being a nightfall, meaning that you can only seek out such weapons when the game decides to let you farm it. D1's skeleton key system allowed players to have a guaranteed chance at the roll for a specific weapon that you're looking for, with the exception of strikes that are a 50-50 between a weapon and a class item, uh, Undying Mind, for example. All you have to do is load up the heroic version of a strike on a map or find said strike in the strike playlist, insert your key at the end of the strike when the boss is dead. Players can earn these keys from various quests as well as just by doing strikes themselves. Along with being rewarded for the more strikes you complete, you also gain faction rep for the Vanguard as well as Dead Orbit, New Monarchy, Future War Cult. These factions gave players even more incentive to rank up by doing strikes so that they could pick between three loot pools at the end of every rank up. Players could choose between armor, chroma armor, which is a variant of the armor with like cool lighting and stuff, and weapons. These narrowed loot pools made it easier to grind strike-specific weapons slash armor while still leaving the random rolls luck in play. In Destiny 2, we have a token system which could be compared to the reputation system if you really wanted to, but it severely lacks in feel of satisfaction, especially when rank ups are only 20 tokens. It is very convenient being able to rank up as you choose with the tokens and not forcing you to take trips to the tower, but at the same time players can abuse the system and save thousands of tokens for whenever a loot pool refresh happens and then burn out quickly. The Pledge factions, New Monarchy, Dead Orbit, Future War Cult, and Destiny 1 also faced this same issue, being able to burn materials in exchange for rank ups, but these materials were a lot more meaningful and useful for more things inside the game just outside of rank ups. These materials also couldn't be purchased in ridiculously large quantities the way that you can from Spider in Destiny 2. Legendary Shard Economy The Legendary Shard slash Mark Economy has shifted dramatically from Destiny 1 to Destiny 2. We went from being capped at 200 marks in Destiny 1 to having no cap in Destiny 2 and the most excessive plethora of shard sources in Destiny 2. Take the Imperium Foundation event for example. Players who had thousands and thousands of shards saved up from all the weapon farming world drops over the years, invested all their materials into the event, still participated and did some crazy amount of donating, and are now getting tens of thousands of shards back. While this is a good way to teach players how to invest, this made the shard slash material economy so much more inflated. It would be better if there's something that gave players incentive to farm slash dump them somewhere other than masterworking or buying from spider, but there really isn't much of an option there. Players will only continue to accumulate more and more materials as time goes along unless there is some sort of way that Bungie plans to wipe the slate clean. If that doesn't happen, these players will be set for the remainder of Destiny 2's life cycle. Raid Difficulty Raid difficulty in Destiny 2 has taken a drastic turn since Destiny 1. There are many small details that constitute for the overall changes in the raid environment, res tokens, well of radiance, weapon slotting system, empowerment slash debuff stacking, lack of mobile bosses, excess of immunity slash stomp mechanics, etc. One of the best phrases that reflects the state of Destiny 2 raiding nowadays came from Dado in his well of radiance slash PvP video that he made right before Forsaken. Uh, quote, uh, one phasing bosses should be a feat, not a standard. This proves especially true in a raid like Last Wish, where players for the longest time were never forced to use stun mechanics on Shurochi slash Morgoth. On Riven, the standard since around day three of the raid's release has been to stick six players on one side of Riven and do enough damage during the eye-popping phase that it will completely negate every mechanic in the boss fight and center straight into the final stand segment. 
When things like auto reloading slash multi multiplicative buff and debuff stacking existed, boss bakes took little to no planning slash skill to execute. With the changes that took place uh, in Shadowkeep, it loosened the skill gap slightly when auto reloading and buff stacking was nerfed, but this still is severely lacking in terms of risk reward to execute these boss bakes. Not every boss needs to be structured in the same way, but when players are going for the most efficient bakes uh, to a boss, it used to require you to actually put yourself in some sort of danger. Bosses in Destiny 2 rarely put you in any sort of real danger, especially with things like Well of Radiance in the game. You are able to out-heal uh, boss, boss burn effects, boss stomps, rockets, etc. Not to mention that Well of Radiance also gives you a continuous 25% weapon buff on top of the ridiculous healing effect. The best example that I remember in terms of a good risk-reward system is Vosik from Wrath of the Machine in Destiny 1. Uh, there's a strategy in which players can stack weapons of light slash melting points with a final round shotgun to continuously stun the boss to secure a one phase with ex some extreme damage. This only works when all players of the team are in sync and can communicate properly. Any sort of misstep from one of the parts can cause the boss to stomp and wipe the entire team or not secure enough damage to make the, the kill worth going for to get the one phase. The strat is not something that players are forced to do by any means at all but is totally optional and is not a standard to one phase. Giving a subtle nudge towards making the boss not being one phaseable without damage gating will force most players to use multiple phases to complete a given encounter. When players have to repeat the segment to reach damage, there's a chance that will, they will fail and have to start over. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It teaches players to learn from their mistakes and try and execute better the next time. It can cause tension to build, which is completely natural, but when players get that completion and get rewarding loot, it makes the whole experience feel so much more complete. Rather than raids feeling like a chore to get the loot out every week, one other key reason as to why these boss bakes are so standard was mentioned earlier, and that is because of the ease of overleveling. TLDR, when a player's power is over the raid enemy, they pose as no threat to them, or not as much of a threat. Solutions? There are probably an infinite amount of solutions that could be implemented, but it's very situational to each boss. Some bosses are susceptible to crit-based damage, and some aren't. Giving a boss more health could uh, also help in some scenarios, but won't fix everything. The most general feedback that I could give in order to secure a better risk-reward and non-standard effect moving forward would be to try bosses that are similar to Crota or Oryx that are not directly killed via weapons, but with relics or other means. Bosses that are killed with weapons could be a bit more aggressive, have alternative means to punishing risk-reward players rather than just stomping, implement side mechanics during DPS phases that all six players uh, that makes it so all six players can't just stand in a well and shoot. Many of the bosses in the game struggle with that last issue in particular. Besides the boss just being the main threat, try implementing ads that are actually threatening instead of just goblins, shanks, or thrall that are just brainlessly moving forward and not doing anything to the players inside a well. Players could always be forced uh, to be on their toes in a raid. There should be no point in which they just sit back, press shoot, and not have to worry about dying or failing the objective. One last thing to touch on here would be the hero role within raids. It was previously mentioned that there was a reason to avoid creating this role within raids. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe it had something to do with all players uh, have to contribute to an objective rather than just one person being able to carry the team to victory. Uh, regardless of this role, uh, whether this role exists within a particular raid does not mean players have to contribute equally to the end goal. The players who have more experienced knowledge of a particular raid or encounters will naturally be more susceptible uh, to carry than less experienced players. The hero role within raids honestly made a better attempt at forcing players to learn in Destiny 1. Depending on if that role is randomly chosen or by choice will determine how aggressive a particular raid will force players to familiarize themselves with the mechanics. Crota, the sword bearer could be naturally chosen allowing less players to play a passive supporting role and watching how everything goes down. Axis, hero role was randomly chosen, forcing players how to uh, stun the boss around the arena and teaching them about map awareness and adaptability. The hero role can be one of the main reasons an encounter is very thrilling and memorable for players. In the end, it should come down to practice and execution. 
Given the time, anybody can complete a raid if they really want to. These are activities uh, that people mainly remember the PvE side of the game for. When players have recollections of times when they went through a struggle to get some sweet loot, it makes it 10 times more memorable. And those are the types of experiences that you want to have with your friends. A journey to completion. Exotics. Uh, no beating around the bush here. Exotics in Destiny 2 are just too easy to acquire. Whether it's through Xur, farming Leviathan keys every week, or 980 Nightfalls, or just random drops, they're dropping way too frequently after updates which made them less frequent. There's no real excitement to getting them anymore other than the occasional good stat rolls that you might get from Transversus Steps, Stompies, Line Rampants, Ophidian Aspects, etc. Many of the new exotics that have been put in the game are obtained through easy to complete quests, which is fine, but they literally don't take much time to complete and get through at all. If they're going to be easy to complete, at least make them a little bit more time consuming. This does not mean the solution is just to immediately time gate. Moving forward, I'd love to see more reworking of exotics that have no purpose in the game right now, instead of adding new exotics every season just for the sake of them being added, uh, subsequently collecting dust in the vault. Uh, there are many exotics that have plenty of potential to be fun and useful to use. Huckleberry, Sweet Business, Lumina, Bad Juju, Outbreak Perfected, Rat King, Teraba, Sleeper Simulant, Xenophage, Deathbringer, Two-Tailed Fox, Acreus, Darcy, but just can't stand up to the titans of the PvE Empire like Izanagi's, Anarchy, 1K Voices, Tractor Cannon, Divinity. The same concept applies to exotic armor. I understand that not every exotic needs to have a PvE-centered purpose, but many of them seem like they're originally slated to, and they aren't good in the current meta. Giving these weapons some tweaks and giving them a shot uh, to be really great options or alternatives would add variety and keep them from being dusty. Let's take a little bit of a deeper look into some potential reworks that could possibly benefit PvE. This one is always on my mind since it got nerfed. Sleeper Simulant was a fan favorite from Destiny 1. It went from being a straightforward point-and-shoot titan in Destiny 1, to being a scenario-based Titan in Destiny 2. Before its nerf, in order to maximize its damage potential, players would need to intentionally ricochet the sleeper shot right before it hits its target, so the shot would split into smaller beams. Assuming all the smaller beams connect on its target, then the damage is maximized to its true potential. And this was incredibly hard to pull off in most scenarios, other than Argos, Morgoth, and in Gambit. Uh, the smaller split ricochet method was nerfed uh, in the patch right before the launch of Crown of Sorrow, and I still have not seen a single player use it since. If the ricochet mechanic is the main reason it's still nerfed, buff the single shot damage so it can stand some sort of a chance. In order to hit effectively hit damage, uh, players will need to land headshots with it, so there's no reason that it needs to sit and collect dust. I guess you could say the same thing about most linear fusion rifles. They have received buffs in the past before, but they just still don't really have a purpose in PvE. Huckleberry. The concept of Huckleberry is a great idea for an exotic SMG. The main issue that it faces is that it eats an exotic weapon slot while its alternative, the Recluse, is a better option because it is a legendary SMG that provides the damage bonus uh, with a really fast reload on kill. If there was a good differentiation with bonus damage between the two, it might influence players to be more open to trying it. The other key issue it faces, uh, besides just being an exotic, is that many of the good DPS options are also exotics, meaning that players will prioritize good damage over an ad clearing weapon. Give it a higher rampage stack, different damage perk, or something that will put it over Recluse's head. Otherwise, you will just have to nerf Recluse. It's been the ad clearing meta for over a year now, even after, uh, I think it was one or two nerfs. On the contrary, one could argue that it would be better to tone down the strength of most powerful weapons in order to create a balanced playing field that results in enemies being harder to kill because weapons got balanced to the lower end rather than being brought up. This shouldn't be the solution in all cases, but the continual power creep has brought us to the point that there is a well-defined gap between the good weapons and the best weapons. The best weapons make the good weapons seem less than good because of how much more effective they are. Players are always going to resort to the most efficient solutions to solve their problems, uh, as is human nature, unless it requires more effort. And in the case of exotic weapons, particularly exotic heavies, they don't always require the most effort to get max DPS, other than to just land a shot on the enemy. 1k, Anarchy, Prospector, Tractor Cannon, uh, with Divinity, you can include uh, Darcy, Whisper. 
Okay, now we're going to move into excessive damage perks, rune weapon choice availability in the end game. Along with the reign of heavy weapons in the PvE environment, the only primaries slash specials that aren't grenade launchers that are rendered useful at this point usually contain some sort of damage perk. Kill Clip, Multi Kill Clip, Rampage, Master of Arms, Surrounded, Swashbuckler, Box Breathing, One Two Punch, Trench Barrel, Vorpal, Firing Line, Full Court, If I Missed Any, etc. Some of the perks have no risk reward factor to them. Some just give you bonus damage for seemingly no reason. Instead of just pre implementing the damage or not, use that space for utility or non damage rewarding perks. Triple Tap and Fourth Times the Charm are good examples of a risk reward perk. Players are giving up that perk slot to take a chance at consistently being able to land uh, headshots or crit points to gain a few extra shots. It doesn't just reward a player for getting a kill on an enemy. Getting rid of some of these damage perks and committing to making more utility-based perks would encourage players to use a variety of items instead of just the few select items that give you bonus damage alongside gaining bonus stability reload range. In reality, you can pick up pretty much any legendary weapon in the game that you want to and complete any activity in the game if you know how to optimize. This isn't necessarily a bad thing in all aspects, but it really goes to show how bad the limitations are uh, between what is good and what is great. Players will usually only use the great weapons unless they are new to the game and don't have the best weapons. XP in Destiny 2. The current emphasis on bounties in Destiny 2 makes it feel like more of a chore than a goal for players that they want to achieve. The most efficient way to grind away XP for the season pass or artifact is by repeatedly grinding the extra moon bounties from Eris. If a player is proficient at doing so, they can easily get 8 to 10,000 XP per minute once they get into the swing of things. This can result in players finishing the season pass or having an insanely high artifact power bonus in just a few days, which is fine if that's how you want to play. The problem is, is that there should be a better emphasis on completing activities in the game rather than just bounties being the main source of XP. Turning down the XP gains on bounties would be the simple solution, but with that there could be better implementation of rewards, uh, material rewards with them, that way spider isn't the main source of material gains. Living on Nostalgia. Throughout the entirety of Destiny 2, many weapons or armor pieces have migrated over from Destiny 1 to Destiny 2. Many of these items kept at the same style, but had a revamp on how the special perks work. Giving the weapon a little tweak can be cool in some instances, but the whole reason for bringing items back should be based on the ide ideology that it will return in the status that which it once had. When these revamps don't meet player expectations, or sometimes that they exceed their predecessors, uh, they end up being an oh cool moment rather than having any practicality. Uh, take for example if they brought Gallahorn back and it just wasn't good in Destiny 2. Rocket launchers are not in a great spot in Destiny 2, it would just be the biggest letdown ever, you know? It's hard to live up to that Gallahorn expectation. I don't want these items to sit and collect dust in my vault, but when you re-implement an idea from a game that seems to run on a completely core gameplay strategy, it will definitely perform differently in the gameplay environment. As of the current season, Season of Dawn, 37 of the 145 total exotics in the game are reworks that have been brought over from Destiny 1. This means that roughly 1 in 4 exotics that are brought into Destiny 2 are reworks from D1. If I really wanted X exotic back, I would just go play Destiny 1, especially when the reworks don't stand up to their predecessors. Some example of exotics that have exceeded their D1 ego in D2 include Transverse of Steps, Outbreak Prime, Slash Perfected, Ace of Spades, etc. While it is cool every once in a while for a monster exotic to return, looking at you, Whisper Slash Outbreak, uh, most players have become too accustomed to this type of thing happening or expecting some old exotics to return with it. I think we can all agree that the best video game memories and experiences come from the side of unfamiliar territory. Sometimes it's nice to have a little taste of home, which is something you're familiar with, obviously. But when you overdo it, you're way less likely to experience the moments of destiny. Supers are too strong. While many of the supers within Destiny 2 have undergone many changes to balance them to their current state, many of them still reign supreme over other options and make the PvE experience too easy. 
Above any other and all other super abilities in PvE right now stands Well of Radiance, and it has since its introduction into Forsaken. Well is the standard for any PvE experience, making sure that there's always one Warlock in the game using it, if not every player in the lobby, uh, using it with the Luna Faction boots for the extra reload boost. Destroying auto-reloading was a good step in the right direction, but this super still has way more to offer uh, than most abilities in the game. The actual super itself has a radius of a school bus, allowing six players to easily fit inside. Within the well, players have ridiculously fast healing capabilities with 25% output bonus damage for 30 seconds until it disappears. On the same subclass tree, players can also use a healing rift and a healing grenade. The ratio of risk reward on the subclass is 99 to 1 because it allows for such passive team play. It can also be used for aggressive play, but the current meta does not call for or require any close range battles. When they do, players can continuously eat boss stomps or any other damage inside a well with little to no risk of dying other than being launched into a wall. How can well move forward without completely destroying its purpose? Since the super itself is basically just an upgraded version of a rift, maybe there's some sort of given pull. There could be a trade-off with the size of the well, meaning that uh, since it's much bigger than a rift, it means that the healing could be a little bit slower than a rift, making it more balanced since everyone on the team shares the benefits while inside. Another solution could be that well uh, could be changed to only benefit the supercaster themselves. Uh, this would mean that uh, this would result probably in uh, a lot more players switching to well so they could gain the benefits of it, but that's some sort of a start. There are probably many other solutions that could work and balance the subclass out, but the main issue that needs to be tackled is the excessive healing effects. Some of the same things could be said about Titan Bubble. Since the Weapons of Light Bubble was reintroduced, it has done both good and bad. The Titan has definitely gotten some more utility, which is nice, but I feel like it has done more harm than good. Players were previously able to use Weapons of Light via Mid-Tree Blocking Sentinel, the subclass is super fun by the way, and this was much more time limited than Bubble is now, and could only be used by any other player on the fire team, so up to five people. Top tree bubble weapons of light can be used for up to 45 seconds uh, with by all six players every single bubble if players refresh their buffs accordingly. On top of that, inside the bubble, six players have armor of light, which is an insanely beefy overshield. Additionally, if the bubble placer has Helm of Saint 14 on, players are also granted an overshield every time they refresh from the bubble. In conclusion, players can reap the re all three rewards of Destiny 1's bubble subclass at the same time, Armor of Light, Blessing of Light, and Weapons of Light with one exotic while having a time advantage over Mid-Tree Sentinel, rendering Middle Tree Sentinel a, a lot more useless than it was previously. Now for miscellaneous ideas, some of these may be reiterated through previous stuff said, but um, while the game is catering to a vast player base, encouraging all skill levels, veteran and high tier players need continued incentives for replayability, continued engagement, and challenges that are exclusive to the 1%. Each group has its own wants and needs, and it feels like there's a lack of incentive for the hardcore player group, the ones who are always there and continue to come back for releases and play the game. For the hardcore group, there needs to be some sort of something with replayability value. 980s would fit into that category, but as soon as you get the good rolled exotic slash materials you want from 980s, there's really no other purpose to play them. Weapon quests. Current weapon quests can feel very frustrating due to the fact that we're often forced to use a specific type of weapon, which is fine every once in a while, but it seems to happen literally all the time that we get weapon quests now. Also, a lot of these quests feel like a fight against your teammates for kills or whatever it may be in the particular quest, instead of working together to achieve a common goal. This applies to other parts of the game as well, specifically like in strikes, I guess. Sometimes you'll have a teammate at the beginning of a strike who will literally just turn around and go the opposite way so they can go to a lost sector and finish their bounties fast. This can be really annoying. And uh, I mean, it, like I said, it applies to other quests too. It's not just strikes. Um, it is very situational based on the quest, but you should definitely be working towards a common goal and strikes instead of being forced to go out of your way for efficiency. And the last little section that we have for PvE here is about the drip feed model, which is the content model that we have right now versus the Destiny 1 all at once model. The drip feed model spreads content out over a whole season, which is cool, but the drip to drip uh, section usually isn't enough replayability value to carry in between those points without having a dry period in between. 
Uh, it also forces players to play a certain way instead of being able the way that they want to play. Uh, basically, we're being told how to play the content in what order, which, I mean, it makes sense in a story sometimes, but it just feels too directional. This allows players to have something to do every couple of weeks guaranteed, which present, w prevents the end-of-season drought that you get with the all-at-once model, which is good. Uh, the drip feed gives players extra time to catch up on things that they may have missed in between or previously. Sometimes it feels like players are being forced to come back to play, especially when something comes out on a Tuesday release and it's not something that is like super time consuming or players don't know if it's time sensitive or not. Uh, this is never always clear. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But players are always going to have that fear of missing out feeling unless it's directly stated. And the last thing about the drip feed model is that it forces title slash seal hunters to wait uh, because of time gated content, giving a lesser sense of accomplishment when it is earned because Bungie chooses when players are going to be able to finish these titles and seals rather than players being able to do it whenever on their own terms. Okay, and for the all at once model, it allows players to choose their own order of operations, which is that that's absolutely massive. Being able to do what you want when you want. If players want to go through and burn all their content at once, that might give them the freedom to try other parts of the game or maybe other games if they wish to do so. Allowing players to worry less about missing out on something because of work, school, etc. And when mostly everything is incorporated at once, not saying it needs to all be there at once in the all at once model, but this often allows players to discover secrets on their own, which makes it much more exciting rather than being told when something is coming out. Pl player self-discovery is just, it's a way better feeling than being told when a, in quotation, secret is coming. It's not really secret if you tell people about it, you know? That's going to do it for the PvE side of things. Again, this is just to get the communication flowing, maybe get the community talking if we can. I just love to, I would love to see some more replayability value in the game as well as some more difficult content coming and staying difficult when, especially when you're over leveled, it, it remains difficult. And the million other points that we made throughout the rest of the stuff. Thank you guys for listening to me rant. I'm going to throw it over to the PvP side of things over to Mr. Giggs since he's a lot more experienced there and a lot more qualified to talk about PvP stuff than I am. So that's going to be it from me, guys. Thank you for listening and enjoy Mr. Giggs, dude. All right, what's going on, guys? Giggs here to talk about some PvP feedback. So let's jump right into it. Uh, point one would be that connection preferred matchmaking doesn't seem to be working at all. Uh, so classic mix, as everyone knows, is supposed to be connection preferred matchmaking and that's it. But even though it's connection preferred matchmaking, I'm still matching the Korean Olympic team every game. Uh, and that just shouldn't be a thing. The further away a player is from you, the, uh, the higher the ping. Apparently, I, I don't know what the system is, but this doesn't seem to be working. Uh, I would imagine that the longer you search, the more it expands your search. So it tries to get you a quick match so you're not sitting in orbit for a while. But I don't think I should ever be matching someone that literally is on the opposite side of the planet, 80,000 miles away from me. Uh, so yeah, that would be an issue. Issue number two would be that comp survival doesn't match off of rank. Now originally, and pretty much in any ranking system ever, you would match people that are at a similar rank to you. Instead, they've changed uh, comp and sur or survival, whatever you want to call it, to be uh, skill-based matchmaking. And with skill-based matchmaking, that just gives people a completely different experience. You can actually get to the highest rank in Destiny uh, with a negative win to loss ratio. You can lose more games than you win and still get to the highest rank. And if they really want a true ranking system, this shouldn't be a thing. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a big issue. Uh, comp and survival also doesn't feel rewarding. Uh, once you get your, your not forgotten and you get your unbroken title, then w what is there to chase, right? There should be seasonal rewards. Give us a cosmetic. Let me get a top hat and a bow tie for getting to the highest rank, you know, just spitballing random stuff just anything that's cosmetic you know just something even it's something so small could be worthwhile um right now there's also too many playlists point number three too many playlists in matchmaking why do we have two rotators why do we have control and classic mix why is there you know i, I think it's how, how many plays we have we have two rotators rumble control uh elimination comp survival freelance comp survival and classic mix that's just too many playlists that are splitting the population up and you know what i would like to see is them to condense that to get you know a higher population in each server have have rumble have classic mix have have uh 
you know, comp survival, freelance comp, and then have trials and then Iron Banner when that comes out. I think that'd be a lot better and, and condense the population and get people uh, into, you know, more playlists, faster games, that sort of thing. Uh, right now, Classic Mix is just hidden at the bottom right of the uh, director, and I think that's completely intentional. Ever since Bungie added Classic Mix to the bottom right of the playlist, it's kind of hidden. It doesn't even look like the other playlists. So by doing that, the only people actually searching Classic Mix are people just trying to pub stomp. So Classic Mix is actually, by them doing that, the sweatiest playlist in the game. There's no actual place where you can just get a social experience in PvP. It just doesn't exist right now. Uh, another point would be that the top competitive players uh, would really prefer if the comp ranked playlist was Clash and some sort of objective mode. Uh, right now, the only real, like every, every single game type in the game right now is some sort of team deathmatch, okay? It's get kills, and that's the only way that the score counts, right? That's Clash. Uh, it's get kills with, you know, some alphabet letters. I'm talking about control here. Get kills, and you only have a certain amount of lives. You know, everything is get kills, get kills. There's no actual true objective mode. Uh, but right now, Clash, Clash is the most competitive mode. Uh, it's what's played in tournaments. So, I mean, if, it would be nice if that was reflected in the actual ranked playlist. Um, right now, PvP rewards feel extremely lackluster. Uh, there are no, there's not a single good weapon that can drop in the PvP loot table. Literally, after every game, most players are just deleting everything they get. They're, they're, the PvP loot table is awful. There's not anything that I care about. In Destiny 1, you had things like the IS Luna that could drop at the end of the game. And, you know, that, that's something for players to chase and to, to actually go for and, you know, have some sort of reward for putting time into PvP. Uh, so right now, we don't have our IS Luna, and I think that's a big problem. Also, right now, PvP feedback feels like it's being ignored from its top players. Uh, for example, uh, I've been telling certain Bungie devs that the map Dead Cliffs, uh, when you play it on control, it is a completely broken map and mode combo. Uh, the way it works is if you're spawning an A on Dead Cliffs control, it is so impossible to break out that you're just constantly getting spawn trapped and spawn locked. It just should not be. It's a good map, but it should not be played on control. And it just feels like certain feedback from PvP players is just being completely ignored, um, which is really frustrating. The final point I want to make is about instant respawns in 6v6. I think this is really important to PvP and the 6v6 experience. Um, instant respawns create such a fast-paced and fun atmosphere. Um, it, it was just, you could get crazy highlights. It was really fast-paced. Ever since they removed instant respawns, um, people have been getting spawn killed less, yes, but the overall game has been slowed down so much and it actually didn't fix the spawns. You still get spawn killed. It's just that the overall game is so much slower that it doesn't happen as often. And in the case where you do get spawn killed, okay, you die first, okay? You're sitting there for seven seconds and then you respawn, you get spawn killed and now you're sitting there for another seven seconds. Now you've actively been out of the match for 14 seconds. Whereas with instant respawns, you're immediately back into the game. And I also, for whatever reason, I think it's actually healthy for the uh, mental side of things. So let's say you get killed by a Lord of Wolves controversy hold user, okay? You're sitting there watching this guy for seven seconds run around knowing damn well that he should have killed you and he only killed you because of his loadout, right? Whereas with instant respawns, you're instantly back in the game, you've already forgotten about it and you're thinking about your next move, right? So I think, I think instant respawns, it speeds up the pace of the game, it's more exciting, it's more exciting to play, it's more exciting to watch, and it's overall faster for the game, right? A lot of games now, most, almost half of the games I play go to the time rather than the score. I think that's a problem. I really wish they'd bring instant respawns back. Anyways, those are some PvP points that I want to just cover really quick. Sweat, appreciate you bringing me on the video and letting me talk about this stuff. And I hope you guys uh, agree with the points I made. All right, guys, that's going to do it for the video. Again, just to get talking points rolling, uh, feel free to leave your opinions down in the comments below. I know it's going to get heated, so <laughs> try and keep it as civil as possible. Uh, if you guys want to read the full paper with all the notes on it, I'll leave a link to that in the description, just in case I missed anything in this video. But that's going to do it. Thank you for listening, and we'll catch you in the next one. Peace.